welcome to atcm the emergency medicine channel uh, today's our topic of discussion meningitis encephalitis and then brain abscess from the chapter of neurological emergency so uh, first introduction what is mean by encephalitis so itis means inflammation so it is a inflammation of the brain encephalitis means inflammation of the brain so meningitis so inflammation of the meninges so meninges are outer covering of our brain and then spinal cord central nervous system right so encephalitis means specifically inflammation of the brain and then meningitis means inflammation of the meninges so these both condition the causes will be a lot of things are there like uh, infectious cause and then chemical cause metabolic cause but in most acute phase uh, there is a infectious pathology is the most uh, common cause for the encephalitis and the meningitis. So, what are the common causes? For encephalitis, the causes will be herpes simplex virus and then arbo virus. So, these viruses are mostly transmitted by the vector and, and it causing the outbreaks of illness. So, vectors means we know it is a vectors means it is a vehicle. So, the, uh, the disease or the microorganism travel from one area to one area by the vector or uh, some like uh, we can tell examples uh, um, sorry malaria and then dengue so these are the things that will transmitted through the mosquito right so the vector means there is a vehicle one type of the uh, microorganism use some vehicle to transfer from the one area to other area so these are the things uh, these virus are majorly using by the vector and causing outbreaks of illness for example west nile virus rabies and then japanese virus encephalitis uh, the clinical presentation, the first, the person will be appear, appear as a fever, headache, nausea, vomiting and then generalized malaise. When the disease progress means there will be a changes in the level of consciousness including behavior and then personality changes also will occur. Knuckle rigidity, knuckle means there is a neck rigidity will be there uh, that will affect uh, bulbar muscles. So, photophobia and then lethargy, confusion and then might be leads to seizure also. So, the reason for the meningitis, so meningitis there might be two pathogens, uh, either it is because of bacterial and then virus. For bacterial most common organism in the case of neonates, group B streptococci and then uh, gram negative SHCA coli, E coli. Uh, infant and children cases haemophilus influenza and then streptococcus pneumoniae and then Neisseria meningitis, meningitis. So, this is the common thing. But in the case of adult streptococcus pneumonia and meningitis and then uh, listeria monocytogenes. So, these are the common organisms for the bacterial meningitis. And then a clinical presentation wise again the person first the, uh, they will present with an upper respiratory tract infection like runny nose, cuff, malaise. And then when the disease progress they may present with a headache and the knuckle rigidity fever. So, and then chills, photophobia, vomiting, seizure, confusion, the most important thing is a kerning sign and then Prudzinski sign, those are the some common signs that will occur in the bacterial meningitis. So, again it is a one of the life threat condition because of the increased intracranial pressure. And then uh, they, in the case of infant, they will present with a high pitched cry that is mimic as a cat's cry and then bulging of fontanelles. So, fontanelles we know that is the area which is a soft portion of the skull, right? So, uh, that will mainly present in the infant and then fetus. So, the fontanelles will be in a bulge or a swell in nature. So, this is the uh, things, kerning and then Brudzinski sign. So, herning signs how we have to perform means you have to place the person in a supine position with the hip and the knee flex, flexed position. So, hip flexed here, the hip is flexed position. First, the person will be like this one. So, the knee will be also flexed position. So, and then so you have to place the person in supine and then hip and then knee flexed position. We have to try to extend his lower leg or you have to try to extend the knee. So, while the time of extension the paw you can feel some resistance or the person will feel uh, will complain the pain. So, if it is there means that is a positive kerning sign. Okay. This is because of the meningeal irritation. The second thing is a Prudzinski sign. So, we, if you flex the person's neck means if you flex the person's head means the involuntary movement of the, the involuntary flexion of the knee and the hip joint also will occur that is if it is there means that is a positive Prudzinski sign. Okay, These are the two major things that will occur in the bacterial meningitis. 
So viral meningitis, the most common organism is a non-polio enterovirus. It is the most common one. The examples are echovirus and uh, coxsackie virus. So the clinical presentation, as same as whatever the things that will occur in the bacterial meningitis, the same thing will occur. The one distinguishing or one differencing factor is that it, he, it won't cause any in intracranial pressure increase, uh, increased intracranial pressure, it won't occur in the viral meningitis. That is one of the differentiating factor. So how it will, so uh, the, this is the thing regarding the pathophysiology. So how, uh, how the body is reacting to the organism and then how the organism is damaging to our, uh, damaging our body. So two major pathophysiology here we are going to discuss. First one is uh, how the body is reacting to the organism, body's reaction to the organism. Second one is uh, how the organism is damaging, create a damage in our body. So first we will see the how the body is reacting to the organism. So the one thing we have to know is uh, so whenever the microorganism or some other foreign particle attacks our body, uh, that is pathogens affect our body, the first the body will react to the organism by the activating the immune system, right? So the body uh, here the, uh, the temperature will increase and then it will activate some macrophage and then it will activate uh, immune system. So the first important thing, the fever will increase, sorry, the temperature will increase. That is we are calling as a fever or pyrexia will occur, right? So whenever the temperature increase, so it will again, it will have a two major set of factors. So the temperature increases, it will create a problem in your body, mean the same time it will create a problem in your uh, that uh, affected organism also. How it is affecting organism is because of the increased temperature, the the cell unable to process its reproduction or the cell unable to uh, expand its entity or it will affect its growth of the organism because of the elevated temperature. Mean the same time, it will uh, signal to the other immune system. So the increased temperature uh, send a signal to the um, uh, other immune system, thereby it will activate chemical mediator and then neutrophils. So everything will occur. So it will increase temperature, it is affecting the organism. Mean the same time, it will affect your, um, that increased temperature will affect your organ also. So or, uh, if it, it will affect your brain also. How means our neurons are more sensitive to the temperature. So whether the hypothermia or hypothermia, both will affect our neurons. So here we told increased temperature, right? So because of the increased temperature, the, the neurons may get damaged because of that, that uh, loss of consciousness or we know the, regarding the febrile seizure that also can occur. The person may have a hallucination, delusion. So these are the things that will happen because of the increased temperature. So it is, it is like a double sword weapon. So it will affect your body, mean the same time it will affect your, affect the affected uh, contacting organism also. So this is the thing regarding the, how the body is reacting to the organism. Second thing, how the organism is damaging uh, our body or our neurons. So it will create a damage by the, either uh, by the proteins so that will secrete some set of proteins that is either endotoxin or exotoxin so endotoxin means that is mainly released by the gram negative bacteria like e coli and the nigeria meningitis so that is the thing that will release the endotoxin and then coming into exotoxin that is more uh, commonly released by the clostridium tetani so this is the protein so these are the things most essential for their growth of the bacteria so it will um, that protein will release some substance into the cell thereby it will suppress the cell it will take uh, use the all the substance whichever things it want for its growth so this is the protein substance so this is, a, this is the way endotoxin or exotoxin this is the way uh, that uh, because of the protein it will affect the it will create a problem in the or it will create a damage in our body so how we have to manage so most importantly in pre hospital it is related with a uh, supportive therapy only and then be prepared for the seizure because seizure and then fever those are the common things we told because of that uh, if any problem in uh, the person have a febrile seizure related thing means you have to uh, control the fever also and then you have to control the seizure activity by uh, we can for seizure activity we can give the uh, ideal choice is a benzodiazepine either we can have a midas 1 or 2 mg based on the our local protocol we can give and then other risk is the 
more particularly in uh, bacterial meningitis, we told it is an increased ICP, intracranial pressure also one of the cause and then another risk is a septicemia. So first increased ICP, so again one presentation we told the uh, two set of management, first one is a, in pre-hospital, first one is a, we have to head and elevation 30 to 45 degree, the second one is a hyperventilation, 2 H's right, so hyperventilation and then head and bed elevation. So most of the people they may have a doubt in the hyperventilation. So again, we'll uh, little bit touch the hyperventilation. So hyperventilation, the rate we told hyperventilation means so we are ventilating the person above the normal. That is the hyperventilation, right? So the, we told we have to in adult case we have to give a 20 breaths per minute. Okay, with the ambu we have to give the 20 breaths per minute ventilation. So then. So again we told when we should not give the hyperventilation, the contraindication for the hyperventilation we told regarding we have to keep PCO2 greater than 30, PCO2 greater than 30, if it is going less than 30 means we should not give the hyperventilation because increased carbon dioxide was, so that uh, otherwise uh, hypo, that uh, uh, carbon dioxide level it is more because with the hyperventilation it will eliminate the all carbon dioxide right because of that uh, if your uh, PCO2 is less than 30 again if you are ventilating means still more carbon dioxide will wash out. So again if you are uh, what the problem will uh, arise means the CO2 level uh, low means it will dilate all our blood vessels. So the blood flow to the our cranial valet again will increase. So it will again it will increase the intracranial pressure. That is that is the reason less than PCO2 30 means we should not hyperventilate the person. So again the doubt may create here the PCO2 mainly will check in the ABG machine or eight arterial blood sample or venous blood sample. So for that we need a separate equipment or some facility we need that might be majorly available in the in-hospital setup that won't be there in our uh, ambulance crew or pre-hospital setup more come mostly we won't have that uh, much of equipments in pre-hospital setup right. So and then how we are how we can manage means there also we given us some solution like so if we don't have any parameters like that means First thing we can hyperventilate the person based on the SpO2 range and then based on the uh, distress, uh, distress of the person or based on the consultation with the online medical director. First one. Second one, so if you have a ETCO2 monitor means that we can attach and then that uh, based on the treating we can uh, do the hyperventilation. How the ETCO2 will help means, so the ETCO2 value, the ETCO2, PCO2 uh, that uh, a difference will be might be 2 to 5 millimeters in mercury only. So the difference uh, it won't be greater than so 2 to 5 millimeter mercury is only the difference will be there. So we can if it is a ETCO2 of somewhat 45 or 40 means there will be a difference will be 2 or 5 excess or less. So by this you can roughly calculate and then we can hyperventilate the case. So this is the one of the thing and then another risk is a septicemia. So again in septicemia the person may go into hypotension or hypothermia or hyperthermia. If it is hypotension means we have to ready to treat the person with the uh, normal saline or crystallite solution or again if the person is refractory again uh, the hypotension is refractory to the fluid therapy means then we are going with the vasopressors like um, noradrenaline, we have some surviving sepsis uh, campaign protocol guidelines is there, right. So based on that we are treating the person in the case of septicemia. And then the, again then uh, regarding our paramedic ways, encephalitis, it is not a contagious disease but uh, that our um, bacterial meningitis is a contagious one. So we have to take the standard precaution for our health vaccination and all we have to take for. So the second condition is a abscesses brain abscess. So mainly the brain abscess is a one of the major important complication of infection, right. So how the abscess is forming? First one when the same concept only. So the whenever the infectious agent attacks our brain or spinal cord cells, it will destroy the tissue, the immune, uh, the immune system respond by attempting to kill the pathogen. So the first body's defense mechanism. So it will try to kill the bacteria. So right, that is the mechanism. Second thing, if it can't means then the body's second line defense is the to erect a wall to prevent the pathogen from spreading. 
first thing what it will do it will directly affect the bacteria and then our virus or whichever thing so it will directly affect the pathogen to try to kill them if it is not possible means so the wherever the affected cell it will completely it will create a cell death or it will ask the cell to die thereby it will prevent the spread of the pathogens to the other cells or to the other area so so what will happen so over a time this process is continued the tissue destruction or immune system is over responding is that will create a swelling that is called that will result in the abscess so the assessment point wise so the two major things first one it will damage to an area of the brain or spinal cord how so we told there will be a prob uh, that uh, the first line mechanism or second line defense mechanism that will affect or that will destruct your cell right so the particular portion of the area the particular portion of the brain so for example if you are taking the frontal region something is happening means so it the frontal region um, what i can tell for frontal region cell is destructing continuously means the region the function of the region will destroy or the function of the region will reduce or impair so that is why damage to an area of the brain or spinal cord so the focal area damage will occur and then the presence of the abscess within the cranial valet or spinal cord so we know in, in a cranial valet three major things only we have first one is a blood and then we have a brain and then we have a cerebrospinal fluid so if we are adding one more content in this valet means what will happen it will put pressure over the other components so it will put pressure over the blood it will put pressure over the so the other things uh, that um, first one it may uh, increase the intracranial pressure second one it will auto regulate it will reduce the or it will put pressure over the other organs right so two major things these two factors dictate the presentation of the person with the cns abscess so the mostly they will present with the low or high grade fever uh, persistent headache will be there drowsiness confusion generalized or focal seizure and then nausea vomiting focal motor and sensory impairment because of the damage to the particulate area so based on that area that uh, damage will differ and then nuchal rigidity and then hemiparesis so the management ways we have to follow the standard uh, ga care guidelines so whatever we are following glucose we have to keep it main and then uh, temperature and then we should not allow the person go into the hypotension those are the things uh, standard care guidelines in the neurological emergency that we have to follow and then pay uh, close attention for the evidence of increased intracranial pressure seizure precaution and then evaluate temperature in hospital management mainly antibiotic seizure precaution and then sometimes surgical removal of the abscesses so do your best shalom